Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Story Corner Adventures. Today's episode is going to be chapter 11 of The Wheel on the School by Maindert de Jong. Now chapter 11, The Storm and the Storks, takes place on the following day from chapters 4 until 10. If you haven't seen all of chapters 4 until 10, it would probably be a good idea to go through them first. Otherwise, some of the events in chapter 11 may not make so much sense. Let's begin. The storm came that Saturday night. Deep in the dark, windswept night, the storm roared up against the dike and over the roofs of Shora. The wind thundered up out of the North Sea, howled down the narrow street of Shora, shrieked under the heavy roof tiles, and made roaring sounds down the wide chimneys. The roar of a giant. The children of Shora slept. Lena slept alone in the attic, directly under the roof tiles. A sweep of wind slashing under the tiles lifted some of the heavy tiles and tossed them up like paper. They crashed back down on the roof, smashed and went slithering down the steep roof to shatter into a thousand pieces on the cobblestone street. The attic beams groaned. A moaning wolfish howl of wind ran down the chimney and through the trembling house. Lena woke suddenly. For long moments she lay absolutely still trying to interpret the giant sounds that rushed and rolled through the attic. She did not understand in that first foggy lift out of deep sleep. She couldn't make her mind work. Suddenly she quivered. There were tripping, running noises over the attic floor. Something alive was in the attic with her and was running over the floor. Her skin crawled. She did not even dare to twist her head toward the sound, afraid that her slightest movement would give her presence away. She stared straight up, eyes big with horror. At last, her slow senses seemed to come back, despite her frozen scare, and told her the running, tripping noises was rain. Wind-swept raindrops hurling through the spaces where the roof tiles had been ripped off by the wind. She heard voices outside in the storm. The wind caught them up, swept and swirled the bodiless voices up over the roofs. They penetrated to the attic, but they were senseless, meaningless. The wind thundered in the chimney again, rattled the roof tiles and drowned out the eerie night voices. Gradually, Lena understood that the storm old Dua had predicted had come. Somewhere out there in the deep of night were voices screaming on the dike. People yelled at each other against the thunder of the waves and wind. The wind made voices sound hopeless and helpless, like the cries of a wounded animal. Lena couldn't stay in bed. The attic was cold, drafty, and rain-swept. It chilled Lena the moment she let herself down the side of the high closet bed. But she let herself drop and ran on bare feet to the attic window. Lena looked up. She saw patches of dim, confused storm light where the roof tiles were gone. The rain fell through the openings. Lena heard no voices now, but on the dike she saw moving, flickering lights. Lanterns! People with lanterns were on the dike. Now the wind caught a woman's sharp, high voice and swept it from the dike to the attic. The lanterns tossed and swung in the unseen hands that held them. The next moment, there came such a complete lull in the wind. It was as if it had been cut off, as if a great door had closed on it. In the lull, Lena heard men's voices. Men were shouting on the dike. Then she realized the fishing fleet was in. The fleet had made it home before the full storm, and now they were unloading and making the boat safe. The women of Shora must be helping their men, but all Lena could see was the feeble light of the moving lanterns. Right below her window in the black street, somebody called out so suddenly and unexpectedly, Lena jerked back from the window. Then she realized the voice was her father's. Her father was down there shouting to someone. Yes, everybody got in safe, but not a moment too soon. He must have been shouting at old Duwa, 
for now came her mother's sharper voice, urging Dua to go back in his house, not to go out on the dike. The wind knocks you down. I came over the dike on hands and knees, and if I hadn't been dragging a heavy basket with fish, well, it was all that held me on the dike. Don't risk your old bones, Dua. For a second, the words of her mother stood there, clear and precise in the darkness. Then the wind crashed down and the attic roared and shook. Then the murmur of voices in the house below came faintly up to Lena in the attic. Her mother and father had come into the house. Lena turned to rush down the ladder to greet her father, but she was chilled and wet, even her hair. She'd crawl into bed, she'd get warm and dry first, then she'd run down. The murmur went on down below. Lena hurried back to bed, skirting the wet spots on the attic floor. She was so cold she had difficulty reaching up to catch the top board to draw herself up into the high closet bed. Teeth chattering, she slid into bed. After the chill and the damp, the bed was so warm and enveloping, she lay for a while, almost enjoying the little after shivers that unexpectedly came up and raced all through her. She felt her damp hair. Mm, she'd better crawl way under the covers if her hair was going to dry. When Lena woke, the covers were still over her head. Her first gesture was to feel her hair. It was dry. But when she tossed the covers back, it was light in the attic. It was daylight, the confused, troubled light of a, of a dark, stormy day. She had slept all night through the storm. She hadn't gone down to her father. She'd fallen asleep. The rain still fell. The wind still roared above the house. It came in jerky, moaning howls down the big chimney. It was still storming, but it somehow sounded different in the daylight, not so bone-chilling and terrifying. Maybe, Lena thought hopefully, it was even letting up. Maybe it would blow over today. If it did, then tomorrow, Monday, they could put the wheel on the school. Lena jumped from the high bed to rush down to her father. She yelped when her bare feet hit the cold, wet floor. She stood a moment on one foot, trying to warm the sole of her other foot against her leg. As she stood, balancing, she could see from the high attic window the dirty gray spume sliding over the top of the dike. Flecks of it were flying through the air. Behind the dike, the great waves thundered high, and a black sky hung where the islands were supposed to be. There were no islands. It was a real storm. It was Sunday. With a shiver, Lena grabbed all her clothes from the chair and in her nightgown rushed down the attic ladder. <clears throat> Lena did not get to see her father before church time. She had a glimpse of his face in the high closet bed set in the wall of the living room that part of his face between his chin and nose that was not covered by the blankets and his sleeping cap with the long dangling tassel. He had drawn his sleeping cap far over his eyes to shut out the light. The tassel hung over his mouth. It quivered and fluttered there as he breathed in deep, exhausted sleep. Lena tiptoed out of the living room toward the sounds of frying in the kitchen. The wind coming down the chimney roared and bellowed in the stove. Lena's mother at the stove did not hear her come in. I don't suppose dad is going to church, Lena said loudly. He looks as if he could sleep a week. Her mother turned. Oh, he'll be there. You can believe he'll be there out of sheer gratitude for beating that storm to shore. They had a night of it out there in the sea. I'm letting him sleep every minute. The, roar, the wind roared down the chimney and blotted out her words. Oddly, above the wind's roar, the cry of a single seagull came down the chimney. The gull must have been flying high over the house. Even the gulls are being driven inland, and that means a real storm, Lena's mother said, listening to it. Now there were cries of other gulls, eerie and high and windswept. Listen to them, Lena said. They sound scared, but... Mom, if even the gulls can't hold out against the storm, what's going to happen to the poor storks? They're so big, the wind would really hit them hard. 
I suppose they'll settle down here and there and wait out the storm. They're smart. But over the sea? When they come over the sea? Lena asked. Lena's mother shrugged and turned her attention to the fish she was flying, frying on the stove. You and I'll just have breakfast. I'll let him sleep to the last minute and send him off to church with a cup of tea. He'll still be too tired to eat anyway. And I'm keeping your little sister home. Linda's too small to go through that wind. Her mother wasn't paying any attention to her, Lena thought. When breakfast was set before her, she gulped the food without noticing what she was eating. What's your hurry and where's your mind? Her mother said impatiently, sitting down at the table across from her. Mom, I'm worried about the storks. I want to go to church early. Is it all right if I don't wait for you? Maybe some of the boys will be there and we've got to figure out about the wheel. But what if the storks are scattered all over by the storm? Lena, I've got to confess that right now I can't be worried about a stork. I'm too busy being grateful that your father and all the others made it back safely. I'm saying little prayers. But those animals have sense and instincts. No doubt they feel a storm coming long before we people know it. They'll do what needs to be done before the storm overtakes them. Oh, I don't know. But you just hurry on to church and talk it out of your system. Lena flew to get dressed in her Sunday best, but her mother insisted she wear her storm jacket over her Sunday dress and also wear her stocking cap. There's rain squalls whipping up and down the whole street. You'd be soaked through in a minute and all you can keep on is a stocking cap. Lena grumbled but did not argue. She was too eager to get to the church. When she stepped out of the door, the force of the wind awed her. It jerked the door out of her hand and slammed it shut with such violence the bang of the door seemed to shake the whole house. She had to bend into the wind. Stooped like a little old woman, she forced her way into the wind that came in wild screams <coughs> around corners and howled along the walls of the houses down the narrow street. She was glad now of the jacket and stocking cap. As the wind ripped at her, anything else the wind would have torn off her. As Lena staggered toward the church portal, a face was cautiously poked through the open entrance. It was Ilka. Lena pulled herself up the two steps. All the boys were already there, huddled for a little shelter in the partly enclosed portal. Lena stood a moment, gasping for breath. The boys gathered round her. We've been waiting, Ilka said soberly. Have you thought of what this is going to do to the storks? They're all on their way out of Africa by now, and if this storm caught them, they'll be blown all over Europe. If they don't go down in the sea, Yella added. I know, Lena said hopelessly. Even the seagulls can't fight it. It's awful. Yes, but what can you do? Peter said. Just so it doesn't storm too much tomorrow. Boy, with the fleet in, all our dads could help us get the wheel up. If we could get them to help tomorrow, then we'd be ready for any stork that manages to come along after the storm. Yeah, Peter, Alka said eagerly. That's an idea. Get all our dads to help. That wheel weighs a ton. I don't think even the five of us could get it up ladders and slide it on the roof. I know. I helped put up a wheel in Ness, and that was a worn out, dried out old thing. That's what we'll do, Lena said excitedly. We'll all ask our dads. They'll help when they hear about our stork plans for Shora. When it's storming, they've nothing else to do anyway. They'll be glad enough for something to do. Just so it doesn't storm so hard that nobody can get up on a roof, Yella said forebodingly. You know how it goes with our dads. The storm might blow itself out during the night. Then, if it's calm, away they go to sea again. We've got to catch them tomorrow, even if it's still stormy. Teacher would let us, Dirk said. He said last night there'd be no school Monday if he could get the if we could get the wheel up. Of course, he didn't figure on a storm. He even let us pull it, put the wheel in school. Peter told Lena, so it would dry out a little and because Alka was so worried somebody might steal it otherwise. When? Lena demanded, resenting having been left out of things. After all, it was she who had found the wheel. 
Oh, we did that after your mother took you in the house, because you'd been in the cold water so long on that boat, Pierre told Lena. After your mother took you home, we still had to put the wheels back on and reload the wagon. Only everybody bought something from the Tin Man as sort of thanks for helping so. Dirk and me even sneaked some oats for the horse out of that barn where we got the hay. Sort of for thanks, too. Sneaked? Lena said resentfully. Stole. Well, he had it coming, Pierre said smartly. And it was only a couple of stocking capfuls. Lena's thoughts were already back with the wheel in the school. Do you suppose we should ask the teacher if we can build a fire in the stove in school and put the wheel up close to it to dry? It's been underwater for over 80 years, Dua told me, except when the tide was out. That's what makes it so heavy. Dua told me a lot of things when we were on the boat together. Dua told me not to dry it out too fast or it would shrink so much it might fall apart, just like Yilka's wheel, Yella said. Dua and I talked a lot about the wheel last night. Yella wasn't going to be outdone by Lena. Lena had the words in her mouth for further things she'd learned from old Dua, but they had to move away from the church door. The janitress arrived. It was Dua's grand granddaughter, Yanka. They had been so busy planning and plotting and arguing they had not seen her come. Yanka unlocked the door. They trooped into the damp, empty church behind her and started to sit down in the back pew that was reserved for children. I don't know, Yanka said, seeing them sit down, but it looks to me like you kids will be the whole congregation. Only a seagull and a kid can breast a storm like this. I don't see how I made it. My father's coming if my mother can wake him up, Lena said to her. All our dads are, Yella said. My dad said that when you come out of a sea like that and step on a solid dike, you want to go to church right then and there. They'll be here. Yes, I guess so, Yanka said, along with all their thankful wives. I had to argue myself warm to keep my grandfather Dua from coming. She moved off, but before disappearing through a door at the front of the church, she called back, Behave yourselves now. This is a church was a temptation. That is, it would have been a temptation any other time when left to themselves to gallop around and play hide and seek in an empty church with not a single stern adult to hinder them. But they were too worried about the storks in the storm and too full of plans for the wheel. Suddenly they couldn't sit still any longer with their worries in the silent cold church. Alka at the aisle end of the pew got up and moved back to the portal. Immediately, everybody followed him. In the portal, they kept sticking their heads around the projecting piers to look down the street. At last, people were coming, the women first. They came on, stooped into the wind, bent almost double. All the women carried wooden foot stoves with small pots of glowing coals inside to warm their feet in the fireless church. The wind caught the glowing coals inside the stoves, sending showers of flying sparks down the street. One woman hastily set her foot stove down and with her salter beat out a spark that had caught in her wooden sh woolen shawl. The wind ripped at the full skirts of the women. Farther down the street came the fishermen. They'd been to the dike in the wind and storm to look at the safety of the boats look to the safety of their boats and to study, study sky and sea before cooping themselves up in church. Yella pulled the church door open for the women with their sparking stoves. The women came in, breathless from the push against the wind. They stumbled gratefully into the church, their eyes thanking Yella. Now the men approached. The boys and Lena studied the somber faces of the men. Will the storm last long? Alka asked. Days, a man said. The others nodded. A week, maybe. They hurried into the church in no mood for small talk. Now there was nothing left to wait for. The congregation was inside. Nothing came down the windswept street but a gull's piercing lonely cry. Dirk peered out a last time before going into church. 
teacher isn't coming, I guess. I wanted to ask him about Monday morning. Hey, he whispered excitedly. Who do you think is coming to church? Janus. What? He hasn't been inside a church. But Yana has all she can do to push his wheelchair ahead in the wind. Come on, let's help her. Lena and the boys dashed into the street. We'll help you, they shouted to Yana. But Yana wouldn't let them help. Not this time, she said in a low, breathless voice. No, this isn't the time. I've got to push him this first time. The boys did help to lift the wheelchair up the two steps to the portal. Not too far down the aisle now, Janus warned Yana. Not up to the pulpit. I'm not going to preach the sermon. Let's stay in the back a little. I don't want them all to get heart failure. Janus in church. Put the chair next to the children's pew, Lena begged. That's in the back. Just so it's in the back, Janus said. Yana had to sit on the women's side of the church, but the children's pew was the last one on the men's side. The boys took over from Yana. They wheeled Janus smartly to the end of their pew, but then each one tried to maneuver so as to get to be the one to sit right next to Janus. Big yellow one out. Lena got the seat farthest away, tight against the damp, chilly wall. Ask Janus, she whispered. Ask him if he thinks the storm will last, and if there'll be any more storks coming if the storm lasts long. They whispered the question from mouth to mouth along the pew. Yella put the problem to Janus. Janus turned and looked at Yella in disgust. What nonsense, he said aloud, then suddenly remembered he was in church. Nonsense, he whispered hoarsely. All the children leaned forward to hear every word. What are you kids worrying about? Janus said disgustedly. Those few storks you saw are so, so far are just the advance guard, the old timers who are getting slow and need an early start. The young stuff is still coming. The real trek has still got to come. They'll come by hundreds. Are you sure, Janus? Lena whispered from the end of the pew. It sounded too good to be true. Sure, Janus's whisper exploded. Why do you suppose I've been watching birds for all these years? I would practically know all the storks that fly over by name if they didn't have such outlandish African names. The whole bench exploded with giggles that couldn't be suppressed. Indignant heads turned, then stayed turned in amazement at Janus in church. Janus became aware of the people staring at him. His face went red. He hastily snatched off his cap and held it before his face to pray into it as he'd seen the other men doing. Behind his cap, Janus did not see the sensation he was causing. People nudged each other and jerked their heads toward the back of the church. Janus is in church. One by one, they'd looked around a second time, as if to make sure they'd seen it right the first time. There were more whispers. Janus peeked from behind his cap and saw the, hedge, the heads running. Try that again. Janus peeked from behind his cap and saw the heads turning toward him and the children's bench. Without warning, he took the astonished Yella by the shoulder and shook him hard. Hush, you kids, he said fiercely. Can't you behave in church? Hush, I say. But there'll be a lot more storks coming after the storm. Hush. His wife, sitting three benches ahead, turned around to give Janus a warning look. But he was too busy scolding the children and whispering his information. Janus, hush yourself now, Yana warned in a hissing whisper. The Domini is the, mounting the pulpit. Janus let go of Yella's shoulder and sat meekly, staring up at the old Domini in the high pulpit. Yella rubbed his sore shoulder, and then he too sat up as quietly as the other children. Reassured now and calmed by Janus's promise of more storks to come. I hope you stay tuned or return to here chapter 12. Chapter 12's title is the same as that of the book, The Wheel on the School. We've already had a call back to it in this chapter here. See you then.